Lastly, have fun during this learning experience and enjoy gaining new ideas on how to achieve the four pillars of the Mini Medical School, being mentally engaged, socially connected, physically active, and nutritionally balanced. So, let's begin our program. Dr. Kamal Masaki is our first speaker for today, and she's a regular in the Mini Medical School because of her expertise, communication skills, and her compassion. She really likes working with seniors to improve our health and well-being. Today, she's speaking on a topic that people do need to talk about, conquering depression. Please welcome Kamal. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so much for coming to the Mini Medical School. I see so many familiar faces. I've spoken at every one of these, and I see some new faces. So we've got old friends and new friends in the audience, so welcome. Virginia always tells me, please make your talks humorous. (laughs) Today's topic, I can tell you, that was quite a challenge, Virginia. (laughs) But what I'd like you to leave this this room with after I finish is although there's not much humorous about depression, there is so much we can do for it. And so I'd like you to leave with some hope that although this is a serious problem, there's a lot we can do to help people. So these are the learning objectives for today. What is depression? How common is it? I want to talk a little bit about the normal changes of aging because sometimes people confuse that with depression. Talk about the types of depression, signs and symptoms, the risk factors and complications, and finally the treatments. So let's start out with what is it? It's a medical condition that causes a mood problem with persistent feelings of sadness or loss of interest in normal activities. It can be serious enough that it can affect how you think, how you feel, and how you act in your daily life. And it can affect your functioning. It can certainly affect your quality of life and also your relationships. Now, in order to be considered a major depression, all of us feel a little sad sometimes, right? That's normal. This feeling needs to be persistent. It needs to be most of the day, nearly every day for at least two weeks. That's when we say that this is a major depression. Now, I said what it is, but what is it not? It's definitely not normal aging. It's not a weakness or a character flaw. Sometimes people say that, you know, oh, it's just willpower, you can snap out of it. Well, it's not really that simple. Now, our older people are certainly more vulnerable. And that's because they have many things that are happening in their lives that put them at higher risk. For example, bereavement. I remember when my mother-in-law was alive, and she was older, and it seemed like she was going to a lot of funerals. And it was friends, family members, but that was a common thing. Fortunately, did not get her depressed, but I, whenever I'd ask, oh, where are you going today? She'd be saying, oh, another funeral. Serious illness is also more common in older people. And other changes happen in old age as well. So is this a common problem? Unfortunately, a very common problem. We have 6 million people over the age of 65 in the United States. Unfortunately, of these 6 million, only 10% are getting treated. So there's a lot of people out there who are really suffering but are not seeking help and are not getting treatment. And I think that's really a shame. So hopefully if we increase awareness, you might be able to recognize this in family and friends and make sure that they go get help that they need. Minor depression, I'll, I'll be defining these, each of these later, is, seen, is more common, up to a quarter, 15 to 25% of the older population. Major depression, which is severe enough that it's affecting your functioning, In the community, it's about 6 to 10%, but then if you go into hospital populations or nursing home populations, the rates can reach almost half. So again, a very, very common issue. These are the major types of depression. I'm not going to talk about them here because I'm going to talk about each one separately and tell you what they mean. 
So major depression is the most serious one of all of those. This is where you have severe symptoms and they interfere with your life. If you're still working, you can't work very well. If you're at home, you just can't function very well and you're just not enjoying your life at all. The symptoms have to be present most of the time for at least two weeks. Now, one thing that people don't realize, it could be a single episode, but most commonly, actually, people who have major depression have had multiple episodes. This is really a chronic disease. It's actually rare that it starts in old age. Many of these people will have a history of having a depressive episode in younger ages. It may or may not have been diagnosed, though, because, again, if they didn't seek help for it, maybe it was not diagnosed, but they might have had similar symptoms at a previous time in their life. I think most people have heard of bipolar disorder, right? This is where you have extreme highs and extreme lows. The low is the depression, and those can be very severe, and they alternate with extreme high moods, where people can actually be euphoric. And it's, those are what we call manic episodes, where people are talking really fast, they can go through some very grandiose ideas, they go through episodes where they might spend a lot of money, money that they can't afford, or go on a gambling spree, or do something that's really out of character for that person. But they go through these huge highs and lows. Usually this is also a lifelong disorder. It's usually diagnosed in young adulthood. So it's very rare, possible, but very rare, that an older person would have this come up first time in old age. Then there's seasonal affective disorder. How many of you have lived in a cold climate? Can you raise your hands? Okay, a lot, lot of people in this room. I lived in Michigan for six years. I actually did part of medical school and I did my residency there as well. When I did residency, I did internal medicine residency, I used to leave the house early morning. I never saw the sun. I'd get to the hospital. Usually you work all day. By the time you finish, you either leave that night or sometimes the next night if you're on call. You leave in the dark. I never saw sun. And when I had my days off, I was too tired to do anything, so I just slept. So I kind of lived in this little cave, I felt, for three years. Okay. It is kind of depressing, isn't it? And even when you're outside, it's not like this. It's kind of gray, gloomy skies a lot of the year. So I was really, really happy to move to Hawaii. <laughs> This is not a place where we have this condition, thank goodness. In colder climates, you see this in the late fall and winter, where there's less natural sunlight. And fortunately, it goes away in the spring and the summer, so it's really cyclic. Most of the people who have this, it will happen every year. So those people might want to think about moving, if not to Hawaii, maybe to another place like Florida, or California, Arizona, or something like that. Basically, this is an actual medical condition. It's not just you're imagining it. You know, there are actual biochemical changes in the brain that we see. And fortunately, it's very easy to treat with light therapy. And so many people who have this, I guess they continue to live where they are, but then they have light therapy, which helps them with their mood problem. Minor depression, very similar symptoms to major depression, except they're not as severe. There's this condition called persistent depressive disorder, or dysthymia. This is where you have milder symptoms, but they're present for a very long time, over two years. Some people can have this for many, many years. These are people who we often will perceive as just being chronically unhappy. And maybe that's the case, but maybe they actually have a disorder that could be treated. So it's certainly, if it was me, I would certainly be willing to go and be evaluated to see if that could help me feel better. Psychotic depression can be very disturbing, particularly to family members. So these are people who have depressive symptoms, they have the sad mood, lack of interest, but in addition to that, they can have delusions or hallucinations with it. Delusions are where you have a fixed belief that's wrong. And you might think, well, I'll just explain that that's not true. Unfortunately, you can't explain away a delusion. 
that's part of the problem, right? No matter how rationally you explain it, the person is insisting, no, this is true. It needs to be treated. The other hallucinations are where you hear and see things that other people don't hear and see. So again, you can see how this would be very distressing to family members, but again, very treatable. Perinatal depression is something I don't deal with in geriatrics, but it would be before, even during pregnancy or more commonly after delivery. And I think we've seen some press of famous people who've had postnatal depression and then have done really badly with it. Very treatable as well. So what are the signs and symptoms? Well, for a major depression diagnosis, you need at least one of the top two. So a sad mood, or what we call anhedonia, or lack of enjoyment or pleasure in activities. You'd need one of those two, plus you need at least four of the other symptoms. So it's things like sleep disturbance, lack of interest, guilt or hopelessness or worthlessness. Energy can be very low, so somebody's just feeling tired all the time. Concentration can be very poor, so these people can have trouble remembering things. In fact, sometimes it's mistaken as Alzheimer's disease, because there are, I, I will talk about that a little later, there are a lot of symptoms in common between both. Appetite or weight changes can happen as well, in both directions. In elderly, it's usually that they stop eating. They lose their appetite and they stop eating. But the opposite could happen, is you could eat too much and gain a lot of weight. So both are possible. Uh, there's psychomotor retardation or agitation, which I have on the next slide, and then you can have suicidal thoughts or attempts as well. That's, of course, a very serious complication. Some of these patients will have a lot of physical symptoms. And sometimes they can be very vague or sometimes they can be very specific. You can have aches and pains, headaches. Gastrointestinal symptoms are very common. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, all of those are common in this. The important thing is, of course, all of these symptoms could be linked to a medical disease, right? But these are patients who they've had a medical workup Nothing medical has been found, and these symptoms persist. And even when you try and treat them, you can't really treat them. What you need to do is you need to treat the depression. That will make these symptoms get better. Anxiety can be present with depression quite commonly. Sleep disturbance can go in both ways. You may have too little sleep or even early morning awakening. So these are patients, they'll go to sleep, but then 2, 3 in the morning they'll wake up and it happens constantly, so they don't get restful sleep. Or they're just sleeping way too much, and it's hard to get them up. I have a teenager, so at times I see that side of it. Very hard to wake her up. <laughs> Psychomotor retardation or agitation can be seen. So on the agitation side, these patients can be very restless, irritable, kind of almost pacing the floor, wringing their hands, can be very uncomfortable to even watch because they're so upset. Psychomotor retardation is the opposite, where the slowness of mood, of thinking, of talking, of moving is very obvious. So that somebody's really, really slow to do everything. So I told you that depression is often seen in young adulthood, right? So how are older people different when they present with depression? In general, symptoms tend to last longer in older people. They can also, just as with every other disease, present atypically. And so the diagnosis is often missed. So for example, when I gave you what is the, how do you make the diagnosis, you have to have one of two things, right? Sadness or lack of enjoyment. Sadness is often not the main symptom in older people. It's often the lack of enjoyment. That's a little bit harder to find. So a physician would have to be more skilled, you know, to get that. Sometimes it doesn't even present as a mood problem. Sometimes the patient or the family will come complaining of memory problems. They'll say, I can't remember. Or the wife or husband will say, you know, they can't remember anything. 
but yet the underlying problem is a major depression. Sometimes you can see a personality change where somebody who is very vibrant just kind of changes personality or vice versa. And the other thing with older people is they may not be willing to discuss it. So they may deny that there's a problem because they don't want to admit to it. So the diagnosis is often missed. Sometimes it's just considered, oh, it's just old age. What do you expect? It's just old age. As a geriatrician, I hate to hear those words. What do you expect? It's just old age. There's very little that that's true for, right? Most things, it's not just old age. Have you heard the joke about the person who went to the doctor and said, doctor, my right knee really hurts. And the doctor said, well, it's just old age. And they say, my left knee is just as old as my right. (laughs) Correct? Can't just brush things off as old age. Social stigma. There's still a stigma with mental illness. And so some people just don't want to admit to it because they don't want to say, I saw a psychologist, I saw a psychiatrist. In older people, it's very common to confuse the symptoms of depression with actual illness or with medication side effects because older people are more likely to have a chronic disease and are also likely to be on multiple medications. Now, sadness is part of life. We all have that, right? Grief or bereavement. All of us have had bereavement. Family members or friends pass away. It could even be from loss of a job. It could even be end of a relationship. It could even be retirement. Some people, you know, who were very invested in their jobs, and that was kind of part of their identity when they retire, it's almost like a form of bereavement. So how do you tell the difference between bereavement and depression? Well, bereavement is a normal reaction. You don't need to treat it. These people can continue to function. It's not like it's affecting their functioning. They're just sad, you know, and it's okay to be sad. Most of bereavement symptoms last for two months. It doesn't mean the sadness goes away, but the most severe symptoms are usually in the first two months. Even in the first two months, if you have very severe symptoms, so for example, let's say somebody's spouse passed away, or what patients tell me is the hardest thing for them is when their children pass away, because that's not how it's supposed to be, right? So that's even harder for them sometimes than a spouse going. But basically they can still function. If they can't, if they're losing weight because they can't eat, they can't think, they can't work, they can't do anything, then even in the early stages, it might be worth a trial of antidepressants because it might really help that person. Now, if the symptoms last for a long time, over six months or definitely over 12 months, and if they're severe enough, then most of us would say it's worth a trial of antidepressant treatment. The difference, again, is in grief, people have a normal self-esteem. The sadness is also mixed with positive memories of the person who passed away. In depression, there are no positives, and the self-esteem is also low. Often people will have the guilt feelings, the hopelessness feelings. Again, time to think about possible treatment. What about dementia? I said that sometimes people who are depressed may almost seem like they have Alzheimer's. Well, there are many overlapping symptoms, Things like loss of interest, sleep problems, appetite problems, lack of concentration, forgetfulness, all of these are seen in both of these conditions. In depression, the mood symptoms are more predominant, for sure. Not so much in Alzheimer's. Now, the memory testing for both, the score might actually be the same. So, for example, one of the things we do on memory testing is we ask what is today's date? Okay, the month, the date, and the year. And what is the day of the week? A person with depression, the way they'll both score zero, but the person with depression is just not trying. So you ask the question and they just, I don't know. I just don't know. The person with Alzheimer's will very cheerfully tell you, today is December the 12th, 1962. Very confidently and cheerfully. Both get a zero, but you can see there's a difference in how they got to the zero, right? 
Now, I do want to point out, depression can actually be an early symptom of dementia. So even when, when people present with memory problems, and I treat the depression because I feel like they have some depressive symptoms, their memory actually gets better. We need to follow those patients because a few years down the road, it could be that this is a very early sign of Alzheimer's. So they do need to be followed and watched. So what causes this? Well, it's not as simple as one thing. Like most things, it's a combination of many factors. As I said, it's very rare that depression starts for the very first time in old age. More often, it's seen in younger ages. Again, may or may not have been diagnosed, but people have an episode that probably was depression. There are definitely genetic factors. So if you have a family history, then that's something to be thinking about. There are biological factors. There could be chemical changes, certain hormone changes that can also contribute to depression. Environmental factors, particularly exposure to war, violence, abuse, poverty, all of these can have a factor as well. And then psychologically, there are certain personality types that are at a higher risk. So people who are more pessimistic or who have lower self-esteem are also at higher risk for developing depression. Risk factors... Past history, if somebody has a history of having depression episodes in the past, it's certainly a risk factor, but also in family members. Female gender is also a risk factor. Women tend to have more depression than men do. And those of you who are married, please thank your spouse, because you're at lower risk. Being not married is a, one of the risk factors. Many of the chronic diseases, I've listed a few, but I can't list all of them, pretty much any chronic disease, and particularly the brain diseases, can contribute or cause depression as well. Stroke, dementia, Parkinson's disease, those are the ones that we worry about a lot. Older people are more likely to have disability, to have chronic pain, and have sleep problems. All of these can contribute. So remember I said depression causes sleep problems. Now I'm saying Sleep problems can cause depression. It is a bit of a vicious cycle where both kind of contribute to each other. Medications, particularly sedatives. As a geriatrician, I don't know if any of you were there for the mini medical school where I did one on medication use. But I'm particularly against sedative sleep medications. If at all possible, we try and get our patients off those and do other things for sleep. Uh, because all of the sedatives can have depressive properties as well. Alcohol. Alcohol is actually a depressant on the brain. So certainly drinking and then certain drugs can cause depressive symptoms. Social isolation. Again, as people grow older, sometimes their world grows smaller. You know, as their friends die, as family members die, their world grows smaller and they can get more and more isolated. So that's one of Virginia's pillars, right, is to be socially engaged. I encourage people to keep your elderly relatives and friends as engaged as possible. And then stressful life events. Even good events. Moving. It could be a good move, but it's still a stress, and that can cause problems as well. Caregiving is a huge one. How many of you in the audience have served as caregivers for friends or family? got quite a few people here. Actually, we've shown that caregiving can be linked with depression, kind of severe depression sometimes, because the caregiver can get burnt out so easily. They are so focused on taking care of their loved one that they're not taking care of themselves and often can have medical problems as well as depression that can cause them to become sick, more sick than the person that they're taking care of. So it's really important we take care of our caregivers. What about the complications? Well, just like illness can cause depression, depression can cause illness, or even can cause the existing illness to be worse. Think about it. If you have somebody who's so depressed that they're not taking their medications, or not taking them correctly, or not following a treatment plan, you can imagine that that illness would also get worse. It's really hard to treat any other disease in somebody with depression without help from family. 
because the person themselves just doesn't care, right? At least temporarily. So you need to have social support. People may refuse treatment because of depression. We, uh, my faculty practice is mostly in nursing homes. So we have a lot of patients who come over from rehab. If they're depressed, they're not cooperating. They're not getting better. So again, it's very important to take care of that before we take care of the hip, or at least take care of both of them at the same time. Alcohol abuse and drug abuse can be a problem. And then family or relationship problems can happen as well, which again worsens social isolation. So again, a cycle. Somebody's depressed, gets into problems with their family, which makes their depression worse, makes the isolation worse as well. So we see the cycle where depression can make any illness worse and vice versa. And what we want to do is we want to break that cycle. I do want to talk a little bit about suicide. Some physicians and some people feel you shouldn't be asking patients about suicide because you'll put that idea in their head. And research has shown that that's not true. You can't put the idea of suicide in someone's head. It's already in there. And by asking, maybe you can make some interventions to help the person. The risk of suicide is increased with older age. And older people who attempt suicide are more likely to have a successful suicide rather than younger people who may have suicide attempts, but maybe they're just crying out for help and they're not as successful at doing it. The people who are at most risk People who are depressed, who have physical illness, living alone, white males are at the highest risk among any demographic group, and particularly those who have alcohol abuse problems. So again, as physicians, we should be asking this question because we want to try and intervene before somebody does something. A quarter of all suicides are seen in those over the age of 65, and often they'll pick means that are are more likely to actually be successful. So I have put up the number for the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, uh, which is an 800 number. So what about the diagnosis? Well, I strongly believe that all physicians should be screening for this. Don't just wait for your patient to tell you. Remember, older people, they're not going to talk about it. Plus, they may not even recognize that they're depressed because sadness may not be the biggest symptom, right? It's the lack of interest or lack of pleasure. So I think it's very important for all people, all older people, to be screened, to look at the medications very carefully. The joke I made before was what we do as geriatricians. We cut out half the medications and we cut the doses of the rest. Guess what? Often the patient gets better physical exam to make sure that there's nothing biological happening, and then some lab tests. Make sure the person's not anemic. Make sure the thyroid gland is working okay. Make sure the vitamins are okay. There's no brain tumor or anything that's explaining these symptoms. And then, if necessary, refer to a psychiatrist or a psychologist. But many primary physicians are very capable of doing basic treatment of depression themselves. What are the benefits of treatment? Overall health improves, quality of life improves, management of their chronic diseases will improve as well. The improvement is usually seen within two weeks, but maximally you need to continue the medication for four to six weeks to really see the full benefit. The treatment is more effective if you start early, so we don't want to wait until the person has been suffering for a very long time, because treatment will be, it'll be harder to treat them as well at that time. And then I'll go through the types of treatments. Fortunately, all of them are effective, and sometimes we actually need a combination of treatments. So these are the three major types. There's medication, psychotherapy, and then brain stimulation therapy. Medications are the antidepressants. When I was a resident, I'm dating myself a little bit, but when I was a resident, the antidepressants were actually not very safe. And overdose was very easy. And unfortunately, often we'd see people overdose on uh, antidepressants and come into the hospital. Now we have lots of antidepressants, and many of them are extremely safe. So that's really good news, because we have a lot of different choices to try. 
Which one will work for each person? Unfortunately, that's something that's not always clear. So sometimes there's a little bit of trial and error. You try a medication, it doesn't work, you have to switch to a different medication, and that one might work. Side effects are common with these medications, but they do lessen over time. So if they're not very severe, I usually will tell people, try stick with it, and let's see if it does okay. With older patients, as with every other medication, we always start low and go slow, because people are more sensitive to the side effects. A very important point is these are not as-needed medications. If you have a diagnosis of major depression, you can't wake up one morning and say, I feel pretty good today, I'm not going to take my medicine. It doesn't work like that. You have to take it every single day. And then the other thing is you need to take it for a long period of time and don't stop suddenly. So let's say you've been taking the meds for two, three months, you're feeling great, your depression symptoms have gone, and now you decide, I think I don't need it anymore. If you stop it suddenly, you will get withdrawal symptoms. So we always tell our patients, please don't stop suddenly. Talk to your physician. They may decide it's time for a taper, but usually I don't even think about a taper until at least six months, sometimes longer. Because again, this is a chronic disease. We don't want the symptoms to come back, and these are pretty safe medications that we can prescribe. Some patients who have multiple episodes of major depression, we actually recommend lifelong antidepressant treatment because it's really likely that they will get another episode if they stop. Okay, this is always a difficult thing for me to talk about, herbal medications. Um, I actually looked these up very recently in preparation for this talk because a lot of people do take these and swear by them, but at least at this point, none of the antidepressant herbal medications have been proven to be effective, and unfortunately, all of them have certain side effects. And they particularly have drug-drug interactions with the prescription antidepressants. So again, very important to be educated about these. When the drugs are not FDA-approved, you can pretty much make any claim you want because nobody's monitoring it, and these drugs are not being monitored. So I don't recommend that people take these. So the three major ones are St. John's wort, omega-3 fatty acids, and SAM-E. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that word. Okay. Psychotherapy is also called talk therapy. Usually it's the psychologists who are giving this, and it teaches people new ways to deal with their feelings and their actions. Cognitive behavioral therapy is one of those. And this is where it teaches you to change your negative thinking and behavior and kind of change it to be more positive thinking. Interpersonal therapy deals with relationship conflicts and teaches people how to deal with that. This problem-solving therapy. Some of these are done as individuals, some are done in groups. Actually, all of them have been found to be quite effective. One of the barriers I've had with this is not, insurance, not all insurances will pay for these. I think that's really a shame. But that can be a barrier for somebody. You know, if the insurance doesn't cover psychotherapy, then they may have to pay out of pocket and they may not be able to afford it. Now, brain stimulation therapy. I'm getting real controversial now. How many of you watched One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, that gave ECT, or electric convulsive therapy, a really bad reputation. That movie. We all remember that, right? Jack Nicholson, and he was awesome in that movie, actually. But, actually, ECT is extremely safe and extremely effective when used properly. So what we do is we activate the brain. We basically, it's electric shock therapy, it's the fastest treatment for depression. Remember I told you for the medications, you need to wait a few weeks before you really see the side effects. I'm sorry, not the side effects, the effects of antidepressants. With ECT, you see the results much more quickly. So if somebody has a very, very severe depression that's life-threatening, also if somebody has a psychotic depression, remember the one with delusions and hallucinations, this is actually the treatment of choice for a psychotic depression. 
it's safe, it's effective, but there's still a lot of misperceptions about this. The way it's done is you have to have a brief anesthesia and a muscle relaxant. The treatment itself just takes a few minutes, but then the patient awake, awakens in about one hour, and it needs to be done three times a week for about two to four weeks. For some patients who cannot take medications for some reason, you can even have maintenance ECT that's done once every few weeks, once they are stabilized. So again, the indications are if it's very severe, if somebody's a suicide risk, if they're unresponsive to medications, or if they have psychotic features. Those are the main indications. The one major side effect that people worry about is people can have memory loss. And mostly this is temporary, but it could be permanent memory loss. It's usually around the time of the ECT that they forget. So that is something that the people have to know about and be willing to accept as a risk. There's a newer type of brain stimulation therapy done with magnets. It's called transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. And they put coils in the scalp, which sends magnetic pulses. It's sort of, instead of electricity, you're doing it with magnets. It does have some side effects, so it's still considered sort of an experimental second-line treatment. It's not done very commonly, but it could be something that comes up in the future. Side effects are hearing loss, which is temporary, headaches, and then very rarely seizures. Unfortunately, as with anything, you know, with magnetic pulses, you can't do it if somebody has metal in their body. So just like you can't have an MRI scan if you have metal, in the same way they'll probably screen out for this as well. Now, instead of treatment, I always prefer prevention, right? It's so much better. So these are some of the strategies that we use. Exercise, physical activity, yoga, tai chi. Uh, I'll show you some exercise data from our own uh, Honolulu Heart Program as well. Keeping active, hobbies, music, art, journaling, meditation can all be helpful for people. Sleep hygiene. Making sure you do things right for your sleep. You know, you don't drink a lot of liquid right before going to bed. Just some common sense things. Don't exercise right before going to bed. You know, there are many things you can do. Don't nap all afternoon. If you nap for three hours in the afternoon, you probably won't fall asleep at night, right? So certain common sense things. Having a good diet, avoiding alcohol and drugs, very important. Support groups for some, education for everyone, keeping socially active, controlling your stress. So with a depressed person, sometimes things can seem overwhelming. So what we tell people is, don't attempt a huge task. Instead, maybe break it down into small tasks and do a small task, one at a time. And then you feel that sense of accomplishment about you got something done. I feel like that sometimes when I have to clean my office. I look at it and I go, wow. Maybe I need to do that, right? Break it up into smaller tasks, so I'll get there someday. Dr. Hedges, please don't ever come to my office. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> Preparing for major life events. Retirement, moving, you can do a little bit of prep. I was just talking to one of my mentors who's in the audience today. And when he retired, he prepared for it and did great. You know, he set up various activities and social things to do and is staying active and is doing wonderfully well. So that's really the way to do it. And then when you're depressed, that's probably not the best time to make important life decisions. So better to postpone them. Okay. So let me go on to the Kokini Honolulu Heart Program and the Kokini Honolulu Asia Aging Study. I've talked about this before in my dementia talk. It started in 1965 at Kokini Medical Center, so it's now 53rd year of follow-up of these men. It started in 8,006 middle-aged Japanese-American men here on the island of Oahu. And when it first started, it was a study of heart disease and stroke. In 1991, the men were now elderly, and it became a study of aging. So the focus shifted from heart disease and stroke, although we're still doing that as well, now to studying diseases of older age, including depression, dementia, things like that, disability. Oops. Oh, that's an excellent question. So why only men in this study? 
The simple answer is it was a mistake. <laughs> it really was. Fifty years ago, they thought women don't have heart disease, and especially Japanese women don't have heart disease, so why bother to study it? Now we know, big mistake. The future, we're, we're doing some offspring studies, Children of the Honolulu Heart Program, who, by the way, are mostly in their 60s to 80s, so they're not children. But when we're doing those, we're including both men and women. But that's what it was. At that time, they thought, why bother to study it? But we're left with what we, what we got. So, so this is the prevalence. So these are people living in the community, not in a hospital, not in a nursing home, just living in the community. And this is what we found. The overall prevalence was about 10%. But only 1.3% were actually taking antidepressants. So again, only 10% of people with depression, so very similar to national studies, right, are getting treatment for their depression. This was a surprise to me. When we looked at it by age groups, it was actually not significantly different. So we have five-year age groups from 71 to 74, all the way here is 85 plus. And there were, when we did the statistical tests, the p-value showed that it was not at all different between the groups. We looked at mortality related to depression, and this is what we found. So when we look at the whole cohort, we adjusted for various factors, including various risk factors, you know, high blood pressure, diabetes, things like that. And we found that overall, the risk was increased by 27%. So when we compared not depressed and depressed, the risk of those with the depressive symptoms was 27% higher over the next six years. Then we said, well, maybe it's all because of disease. The depressed people are sicker. They're dying because they're sicker. They're dying because of their chronic disease. So we split up the group into two groups, the healthy group and the people with medical illness. And we actually found the opposite was true. When we looked at the healthy group, if you were depressed, your risk of dying over the next six years was actually now increased to 56%. Among the sick group, it was about the same. It wasn't really increased. So our hypothesis was, in this group, the mortality, death, is driven by the illness, whereas in this healthy group, it was actually driven by the depressive symptoms. One other possibility we explored is maybe the depressed people had an underlying illness that hadn't been diagnosed yet. That's also a possibility. So those were two things that we looked at. We were one of the first studies actually to show that depression was associated with higher mortality. This is the good news. We looked at... Um, we looked at walking, and so on this axis, I have distance walked in miles per day. This is the lowest walking group, which was less than a quarter mile a day, and then this was quarter to 1.5 miles a day, and this is over 1.5 miles a day on the right. And then we followed them for eight years to see who develops depression. So at baseline, none of them had dep depressive symptoms. So we only took the people free of depression at baseline, and then we follow them to see who develops new depressive symptoms. And we found this low group was much more likely to develop depression, almost double of what the other two groups were. This was just simple walking, not strenuous exercise, just simple walking. So again, physical activity can be very good for you in many ways. So how can you help if you have a friend or family member who has depressive symptoms that you suspect? I think offer support. You need to be very patient. Pushing them too hard might actually rebound. So be really patient and sympathetic and try and convince them that it's a good idea to go and seek help. Encourage them. Make sure that they go see the doctor. Keep track of appointments. Depressed people often will miss appointments because they just can't be bothered to go. Keep track of their medications. Are they actually taking the antidepressant medications? That's really important. Talk. But listen more than you talk. These people need to be heard. Walks and outings, giving them some social outlet is a very nice thing to do. 
And don't ever ignore those suicidal comments. People might just throw them out there. Don't ignore those. That's a little bit different from people when I talk to them about advanced directives, about you know, what would you want if something happened, and they tell me, I'm, I'm ready to go. You know, Don't keep me alive if this and this happens. That's not depression. This is actual suicidal comments that I'm talking about. So, is this helpful? You know, this is what a depressed person feels like when somebody tells them, just snap out of it. Can you snap out of that? But that's what it feels like to them, right? Or just try harder. If you tried harder, you could fix this. It doesn't work like that. This is what mental illness feels like, a tug of war with yourself. The good news is, with treatment, you can win that tug of war. Without it, it's very hard to win that because you're fighting yourself, basically. I thought this one was cute. If you're going to get any joy out of being depressed, Charlie Brown says, you've got to stand like this. (laughs) And then this is a physician talking to a patient, saying, depressed, not sleeping, low self-esteem, still, enough about me. What can I do for you? (laughs) So I'm going to stop here and thank you all for your attention. I... I also wanted to thank those of you who've made some very generous generous donations to our Department of Geriatric Medicine. We truly appreciate it. We appreciate that you're supporting our mission, which is teaching, research, and community service, and clinical care of older patients. So thank you all very much.